go ahead and just say welcome to everybody who's here uh, for our plenary session, Sustainability and Community. Um, the presentations that we have for the session really hit on or exemplify the central theme of this conference and this meeting, which is conservation of fragile karst resources. I think that we have a really great lineup of speakers, of cross-disciplinary talks and speakers. We've got scientists, educators, researchers, all who are working on the management of karst resources, as well as several UNESCO programs designated to protect these fragile environments. Um, this session is being recorded. Uh, Leanne Bledsoe is our session host, and she'll be monitoring the questions throughout the talks. And so if you have a question, please go ahead and message that to Leanne directly, and uh, she'll be keeping track of those, and she'll read those out loud to the speakers at the end of their talks. Uh, if there's time, she may call on you to uh, ask your question audibly, so be ready for that as well. Um, for our speakers, a reminder that we'll give you a chime at your 10-minute mark. Um, with five minutes remaining, and so uh, to wrap up and have questions at that point. And um, we do encourage people to use the reactions to participate um, and, and really become a part of this meeting. And so with that, we will start with our first speaker, who's Terry Bulger. Terry Bulger is a cave and car specialist, member of the IUCN Cave and Cars Working Group, and working as a consultant in Laos. Currently, he is leading and coordinating the geo-heritage aspects of a World Heritage nomination for the Hin Nam Na National Park. All right, Terry? Okay, thanks, Sarah. Hello, everybody. Let me just uh, share my PowerPoint. Okay, today I'd like to share some of my experience working with local communities and villagers for the study and collaboration and collaborative management of geoheritage at Hinnam Nol National Park. Um, this shows uh, Laos, which is located in Southeast Asia. Um, on the map, the, the karst zones are shown in black. Uh, with Hin Nam Nol circled, Hin Nam Nol National Park circled in red, adjacent to the Vietnam border. First, I'd, I would like to briefly introduce the geoheritage of Hin Nam Nol that has been proposed as having outstanding universal value for a nomination as natural world heritage. The polygonal karst has a great variety of landform style over an extensive area. Um, the area of the protected area is 94,000 hectares. That's about 225,000 acres. Um, so you can see the residual conical hills and the and the characteristic of the of the landscape there. Um, the Sebung Phi Cave. The world's lar is the world's largest uh, river cave in terms of passage size and water flows during wet season floods. And in this photo, you can see the resurgence of the Sebung Phi with a large pool outside of the entrance. Uh, these are some photos from the resurgence uh, going up along the river passage to the upstream entrance of the cave. Uh, and also paleocarst evidence, such as the clastic infill seen in the cave ceiling in this photo, indicates a late Triassic karst landscape, which was buried and then later exhumed and rejuvenated. So that's just a brief overview of the, the geoheritage. Okay, so my main subject today is about collaborative management of Hinnamnal National Park which is a partnership approach between Hinnamnal and the local people who live adjacent to the park 
and depend on natural resources for their livelihood. It provides so-called guardian villages with a stake in the resources they are helping to protect through sustainable resource use and benefit sharing in nature-based tourism. Thus, there is a shared goal of biodiversity and geodiversity conservation and poverty alleviation in and around Hinnamno National Park. Uh, this map shows Hinnamno National Park in the, in the green here with the guardian villages indicated by the yellow red squares around the perimeter of the park. So there are in villages of about 8,000 people from seven ethnic groups, the Putai, Yoi, Kalung, Makang, Tri, Nguan, and Chut. Uh, all of the villages and 73% of all households are poor, even by Lao standards. Uh, and thus the, the villagers have a high dependence on natural resources. These are some photos of, of some of the guardian villages uh, and village life. You can see carrying water, uh, just spending time with the family and pounding the rice hulls or rice husks off of the rice. Um, so life is pretty basic and, and pretty hard in, in these villages. Okay, so these are the five building blocks for establishing the co-management system at Hinnamno. Uh, today, I will just talk about number three, the participatory land zonation based on traditional knowledge and customary rights, and number five, involving local villagers in protected area management activities. So Hinnamno has been zoned into areas for patrolling by each of the guardian villages and th those patrolling areas are delineated by the black lines on this map. And the area of Hinnamno has also been zoned as either controlled use zone, these areas in green, which are, which are for sustainable harvest of uh, natural resources by the people in the guardian villages, um, or as total protected zone in orange. And, and these, these zonations were done in a participatory way. The end result is, is that 86% uh, of the area of Hinnamno is zoned as being total protection zone. Okay, so there are, <clears throat> there are about, 120 village rangers from the 18 guardian villages. Uh, they work part-time with Hinnamno National Park staff patrolling the park, where the main threats are wildlife poaching and illegal logging. And there's little threat to the geoheritage values of the park so far. Uh, village rangers are also involved with monitoring, um, recording wildlife sightings and any emerging threats that they might notice. Um, they also assist exploration and research missions, including the geoheritage work that, that we've been doing, where they receive on-the-job training and education about karst in caves. Um, and they have excellent local knowledge of the karst, the caves, and the trails through the karst, which has been invaluable for our work. These are some village, ah, some photos of the village rangers um, receiving training, showing us a new cave entrance hidden in the jungle and assisting geoheritage exploration and research groups in the field. Okay, so there's also um, village ecotourism guides, about 35 ecotourism guides in four of the guardian villages where there are tourism activities. Uh, this is part-time work for them. Uh, they guide tours to caves and walks in the spectacular karst landscape. Um, they also assist with uh, 
monitoring of the Sebungfi cave, um, such as tourism impacts on cave formations and bat populations. So that we've, we've given them some training and they've been involved in, in some of that work. Again, they also assist uh, exploration and research missions, including some of the geoheritage work. And they also have excellent local knowledge of the karst caves and trails. So these are some photos of the ecotourism guides at the Sebungfi Cave, um, assisting a geoheritage research group in the field and uh, guiding tourists on walks through the karst landscape. Okay, some results from co-management at Hinnamdong include uh, management effectiveness has approved by 16% over five years with major improvements in technical capacity and management skill. Um, wildlife sightings of key indicator species have remained constant and deforestation is now negligible. Some of the trails in the total protected zone are now becoming overgrown due to being less used by the villagers after the zoning and patrolling commenced. And so far, there are no apparent impacts from tourism on the Sebungfi Cave. However, further work is needed on uh, capacity enhancement of the human resources. So training of the village rangers and guides and also the national park staff. Um, full implementation of management plans and village co-management agreements, including monitoring and adaptive management and developing sources of sustainable financing required to sustain this system of co-management and thus protect and conserve the karst resources of Hinnamnal National Park. So I'd like to thank my colleagues, Miriam de Koning and John Parr, who are the people who actually developed and established the co-management system in Hinnam Nau. Um, also like to acknowledge the, the people uh, listed below whose photos I've used in this presentation. Um, I would like to thank Hinnam Nau National Park and the German government for supporting the geoheritage work. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Terry. Um, um, please feel free to direct any questions to me in the chat. I have one that I um, uh, wanted to ask. In, in, in one of your slides, you kind of talk about how wildlife poaching and the illegal logging hasn't affected the geoheritage values. And so can you explain how from your perspective, those things seem decoupled because, um, you know, maybe it's just my lack of the, the ter you know, knowledge of the specific term, what you're using for, you know, for what exactly those values are. But could you just, um, uh, you know, maybe cl clarify that a little bit for me? Um, okay, maybe I, maybe I tried to put too many ideas in one sentence. Uh, no, what I was saying is that the, uh, the main threats are wildlife poaching and illegal logging. Um, but so far, there's been little threat to geoheritage values directly. So say from somebody uh, taking formations out of a cave or, or, you know, trying to take some rock formations from the surface cars. Um, so not necessarily interacting with the, the wildlife poaching or illegal logging. So sorry if the, I, I confused that a little no, bit. No, I guess in my mind, I was just thinking like how those things could be affecting cave and karst environments, even if it's not those, I guess that's what I was hung up on or like those geo heritage values perhaps. Um, yeah. And that, you know, maybe it isn't that there's taking of formations, but that those um, activities could still be affecting our, um, say, hydrogeologic systems there. So, no, thank you for clarifying. It was, it was, it was a, um, it was a good presentation. I just was uh, curious about that. Um, um, yeah. 
there's also another question. Um, Chris, do we have time for another question, Sarah? I know we're a couple minutes already behind, but I think we, um, if we, we just give go the, off? If we give the full five, you've got three minutes left. If you'd like to get back on schedule, we can go ahead and, and do that. So here's one question I think that is good because we do want to talk about these trans uh, national transboundary areas. And so Chris brings up, he says, and I'm sorry, I just couldn't find him in the list fast enough for three minutes, but Terry, there's been a yeah. great deal of attention just across the border in Vietnam in the past few years. And it is possible to easily drive into that area from the coast. Has that influenced uh, has you seen any influence on on your side or are they kind of insulated from another um, as far as, you know, looking at these two natural areas, this, um, you know, transboundary uh, protected area? Uh, yeah, that's that's a good question. I, I could have made that a 10 minute talk in itself. So um, but that's why I wanted to leave some time for questions here. Um, so at the moment, they're in terms of uh, like by road. It's not so easy to get from Phong Nha Kabang to Hin Nam Nol. Um, the roads kind of have to go around the, the karst block. Um, rather, than, there's no, no way to get through, through that karst landscape, through the protected area. Um, some of the wildlife uh, poaching pressure is coming from the Vietnam side. Uh, I, I think it's fair to say that. In terms of the the proposal for world heritage for Hin Nam Nol, is that it would become a a, uh, a transboundary site uh, joint with Phong Nha Kaban, which is already UNESCO World Heritage. Um, so you know, so you'd have an overarching uh, management structure to take care of that. And there is some talk about. Um, there's a road that runs sort of from the southern part of Phong Nha Kaban into the southern part of Hin Nam Nho. There's some talk about upgrading that, which would uh, possibly no. So at the moment, Hin Nam Nho, we don't have very much tourism pressure there compared to they're starting to have a lot of tourism pressure on some of the cave and karst resources in Phong Yakaban. So I think I should stop there for now. All right, sure. Yeah, we're right about at time. So you timed that purpose uh, perfectly. Thank you, Terry. We appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, our next speaker will be uh, John Gunn. John Gunn is a professor at, professor at the University of Birmingham in the UK. He's deputy chair of the IUCN WCPA Geo Heritage Specialist Group, that's GSG, and chair of the GSG Cave and Karst Working Group. He is also chair of the British Cave Research Association. All right, John, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, I'm, I'm looking at Cave and Karst Geo Heritage in UNESCO protected areas. And this is gonna be a real whistle-stop tour. Um, I've put the four key tables uh, in the supplementary material. And there's also a paper just being published in Hydrogeology Journal, uh, which you may find useful. I'm gonna just very briefly remind ourselves about global carbonate cast. To look at the UNESCO protected areas, a quick summary and an even quicker what next. So, You'll be all familiar with this, I think. This is the world cast map. And based on this, uh, carbonate rocks underlie around 5% of the global ice-free land surface. 16.5% of the global population live on cast. Uh, we've got a good coverage. How much of that is actually in UNESCO protected areas? So cast geoheritage and cast groundwater are protected at scales from the local to the international. And my focus is on the four UNESCO protected areas. They are biosphere reserves. The biosphere reserve program commenced in 1968. Ramsar sites, and that program commenced in 1971. 
The relative newcomer, uh, UNESCO Global Geoparks, uh, the program commenced in 2004, and World Heritage Properties, uh, a program commencing in 1972. Uh, I'll do a reasonable amount of detail on biosphere reserves and then very quickly go through the others. Um, there is no database that I'm aware of, of biosphere reserves. There is a UNESCO website which provides details of each biosphere reserve by country. Uh, and so this information was input largely by my daughter as project assistant into an Excel spreadsheet. And we logged 662 biospheres and transboundary biosphere reserves in 122 individual countries. There are thought to be more, but if there are, they're not on the website. We then went through the description and searched for keywords cave, gypsum, limestone and cast. Only two sites scored on gypsum and they both also scored on limestone, so gypsum was excluded from the analysis. There were some sites where the keywords weren't present in the site description, but other evidence suggested cast in the area. So we did a further search on the web. If we found evidence, the score was amended. We then added the scores to obtain a site score. If the site score was zero, we can be confident there's no carbonate cast. If it was three, uh, i.e. carbonate, limestone uh, and caves and cast, uh, then we also are confident on that. It's the ones in between that were quite interesting. So if a score of two, they divided into two groups. Uh, groups which scored on cast and limestone, but with no known caves. And that's perfectly understandable because we know of quite a few cast areas worldwide that do not have any caves in them. Uh, and then there were the ones with limestone and caves, but no mention of cast. Uh, they're interesting because potentially people don't recognise the word cast uh, when they're coming to describe uh, their biosphere reserve. Scores of one uh, were biospheres reserves just with the word limestone and the two with evaporite, but no known caves and no mention of cast. We accept those as carbonate cast because pretty well every limestone area globally uh, has been castified to some degree. The biosphere reserves where the only key word was cave, we had to look up a bit more detail. We checked them on the map. In seven, the caves were clearly in carbonate rocks, so that's a carbonate cast. In 14, uh, the caves were not in carbonate or evaporite bedrock, so they're in quartzite sandstone, sea caves, volcanic caves. They're not part of our uh, discussion. So, 151 biosphere reserves, transboundary, 62 countries, total area around 422,000 square kilometres, contain some carbonate cast. Emphasise that word some, some will have a lot of cast in them, some may have very little. This is just to give you an idea of the sorts of countries. Spain comes top, 15 biosphere reserves, uh, Mexico second with 13, uh, Algeria, etc. Seems quite a lot of countries in there have got more than one biosphere reserve with cast. Let's move on to Ramsar sites. In 1996, a specific category ZK was added to the Ramsar classification system. That denotes cast and other subterranean hydrological systems. Now this was a lot easier to search because the Ramsar Secretariat maintains a database. As of the 1st of April this year, 2,388 Ramsar sites, total area 1.3 million square kilometres, 170 contracting parties. So again, sort through the database, looking at the keywords, first of all the ZK sites, a further sort on keywords in the site description, and we came out with 124 Ramsar sites in 55 countries that contain cast. Total area is 48,000 square kilometres, although again, not all of that will clearly be cast. Uh, the top country by far is Mexico, with 31 separate Ramsar sites uh, that contain carbonate cast, uh, and also in terms of area around 17,000 square kilometres. Uh, after that, uh, most countries uh, have got less than five Ramsar sites, 
uh, and the areas, as you can see, drop off pretty, pretty rapidly uh, to just quite small areas. <coughs> The UNESCO Global Geoparks, again there's no downloadable list of UNESCO Global Geoparks but they're shown by country on a UNESCO website uh, and so we built an Excel spreadsheet using that. Uh, on the 1st of April this year there were 147 UGGP in 41 countries. Uh, in July 15 new uh, UGGP were designated and three of them were in what I've called a new country, i.e. one that didn't have uh, a geopark before. So now, uh, as I speak, uh, we've got 162 UGGP in 44 countries. Uh, so the, the information from the web uh, was used to construct an Excel spreadsheet, and uh, we also searched on mentions of cave, limestone, and cast. And so based on the April 2020 list, which is the one that's uh, I've used in the uh, supplementary table. There were 61 UGGP with carbonate or evaporite cast and they covered a total area of 109,000 square kilometres. And we can add to that because four of the 15 newly designated UGGP contain cast. Um, this is just again showing the distribution. Uh, this is the number on this axis. This is the total area in each country. Uh, so the, the greatest area uh, is in fact in Germany. Uh, the greatest number of UGGP with cast is in China with a slightly smaller area. Uh, so again, uh, it's an interesting distribution. Uh, a lot more one could do with a, a table like that. World Heritage properties are very interesting. To be included on the World Heritage list, there must be one, at least one of 10 selection criteria six are broadly cultural, four natural. As of the 1st of April, 1121 uh, WHP covering 167 state parties. And uh, search the online database, 71 in 43 countries, total area 866,000 square kilometer, contains some carbonate or evaporite cast. And the little table down here again is the number in each country and the area. And it's really there to show how misleading the area statistics can be because Russia comes out by far as the largest area, but that's because the Baikal World Heritage property uh, is at least a half of it is Lake Baikal. Uh, and so the actual area of cast must be less. Similarly, uh, I've not included Kiribati in that uh, because it has 40,000 square kilometers of world heritage, but most of that's ocean. Okay, so now to try and put that into a summary. In most cases, the area of cast within each protection area will be less than the site area. We also have sites with overlapping designations, but different areas. I chose the Everglades uh, rather than Mammoth Cave, uh, but Everglades National Park is a World Heritage property with 567,000 hectares. It's a biosphere reserve with 636,000 hectares and it's a Ramsar site with 610,000 hectares. Now how much those overlap is of course uh, impossible to tell but there will be some overlap I'm sure. And the approach that I've done is to take the designated area that's got the largest area. Now we can do this for the World Heritage Properties because the website lists protections by other conservation instruments. What we don't know easily is the overlap, for example, between biosphere reserves, and Ramsar sites, or between UGGP, Ramsar sites, and biosphere reserves. But when you pull it all together, the net result is that we have 375 individual sites in 90 countries with a total area of nearly 1.3 million square kilometers that contain some cave or karst interest. Now I've, I've raced through that uh, quite deliberately uh, to give me a quick what next. How much, two key questions for us, 
how much cast is there in each protected area? And at present, we have no way of knowing that. And going back to my previous theme, how, if at all, is the cast protected? Because some of these protected areas managers may not know that they have actually got cast. So as part of IUYCK, I think we need to try, and that's we as the, the, the global cave and cast community, contact as many as possible of the protected area managers, see if we can find out the answers. See if we can find out how much cast is in each of those protected areas and also to offer advice on how it might best be managed. So uh, some thank yous uh, before I exit. Uh, thank yous to, uh, to those who've contributed. George, help me, George Venny. Uh, Leanne, we've corresponded on Manus Biosphere Reserves. Uh, my daughter helped putting the, uh, the thing together. And uh, Art's there because basically he took me down arguably the best protected and finest cave and cast world heritage property in the world. So there we go. Thank you for listening and uh, I hope I've left enough time for some questions. Yes, we have about three minutes left. Deadly silence. Yeah, Leanne, I think you're muted. Sorry, I just made it possible, thank you, Sarah, for everyone to unmute themselves. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and call up on, um, it looks like Jonathan Putnam has a question. Uh, John, do you want to uh, ask that question audibly? Okay. <laughs> Well, I'll go ahead. And it's, I mean, this is, um, uh, his question is, you know, can the um, IUCN help in getting this information that you're talking about? You know, this, the area for the, you know, the area of karst in these. Um, I know, have we've worked together um, through this new cave map network with some of our other clients. And I want to also mention that um, some of our colleagues on this meeting today um, from Skultian, um, Caves Park. Um, they helped in that effort as far as the list that I shared with you, John, which uh, I know went through several, several edits and revisions, but I do want to recognize them as well and let you address the Jonathan's question. Uh, uh, the, the answer simply is no, because when you go to the, uh, the websites, it's quite impossible uh, to, to work out how much cast there is. Uh, it can be incredibly difficult um, and uh, e even the word search, uh, a few notes of caution because, uh, for example, uh, if you do a search on cast uh, and just say, oh good, that place has got cast, uh, you find some very odd places. And that's because the keyword cast uh, is also part of the Latin name for a particular tree. Uh, similarly, in terms of cave, uh, you can pick up things that aren't actually caves. Um, but the, the, the websites actually provide very little information uh, and many of them just simply do, do not, well, they don't provide any information at all. Uh, it's been really difficult. Some of the Ramsar sites, for example, that I know personally aren't listed as having subterranean wetlands uh, even though I know that they're cast and I've undertaken water tracing experiments in them. Uh, and it's this lack of knowledge uh, of the, the cast within the areas, which is why we need to really get back to some of these, uh, these people uh, and try and, uh, as it were, educate. <laughs> okay, we should probably move on to the next speaker. Thank you, John. That's incredible. <laughs> the first to really um, curate, integrate, synthesize that information and then uh, provide two key points to jump off of from. So thank you. Um, up next, we have Tomas Pelbiz. He's an associate professor in the Department of Physical Geography at Utrecht Laurent University in Budapest, Hungary. He is interested in karst geomorphology and he is working on a project examining nature, tourism, community issues in karstic national parks. Thank you, Thomas. Okay, thank you. Hello to everybody. 
Uh, I'm going to share my screen. I hope that uh, you can see now my shared screen. And I start uh, it with the laser pointer. Okay, can you see my, my image? Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I'm Tomasz Terbis from Budapest, Hungary. Uh, but most of my colleagues are from Serbia, where my study area is found, uh, which is in fact uh, the Tara National Park in Serbia. And there we studied the Karstic National Park's roles and potentials, mm -hmm. and we uh, carried out surveys and uh, interviews about the views and opinions of managers and local peoples in uh, the National Park. Uh, just some words at the beginning. Uh, basically, I'm a geomorphologist uh, dealing with karst, uh, but after some decades of research, I put the question, how is it living on karst? And to what extent is it special living on karst? And um, I started to work with cultural geographers, and I found a theoretical background for these questions. Uh, one is uh, the so-called geographic possibilism, which is an old term used since the 19th century. Uh, and uh, today we use rather the word uh, human environment relations. Anyway, the essence is that we study the relationship between natural settings and social economic uh, development. Uh, it is a, a very basic uh, slide about caste and society relationships. There are some special natural settings on caste that you certainly know uh, about hydrology, soil, topography, and landforms. And these natural settings have some consequences on the socio-economic uh, development. For example, as karst plateaus are dry and the soils are quite poor, uh, they are unfavorable for growing plants. So pastoralism is more typical on karst plateaus. And in many cases, forests uh, could remain as uh, people didn't want or couldn't use uh, the karst plateau for growing plants. Uh, today, as a result, there is a high biodiversity on karst plateaus, uh, which is one reason for karst plateaus are often uh, protected areas today. Also, the topography creates some special traffic difficulties on karst areas. So uh, this is a problem and karst plateaus are in many cases sparsely populated. However, the spectacular landforms such as sinkholes or caves or gorges uh, make them perfectly suitable for tourism. Uh, we have a project about uh, the relationship of karst and national parks uh, and uh, how they work in human environment relations. Uh, it, is in a, uh, it is a regional study uh, of uh, several countries, Tara National Park, uh, which is presented in this study, but also Akta National Park from Hungary, the Slovak Karst National Park, uh, Kruka National Park, Apisani Nature Park from Romania, and Northern Pindos are also included. Our main study questions in that project are, uh, what are the specialties of karstic national parks? What are the order of goals in a karstic national park? Uh, how do local people perceive the advantages or restrictions in a national park? Does the national park can help the socio-economic development of local communities? And from a tourist viewpoint, how do visitors perceive the cast? What are the conflicts uh, between conservation and tourism? And uh, finally, is climate change an important issue in karstic national parks? We have several research methods. First, statistical analysis, which is mainly based on demographic data. Second, we made several semi-structured interviews with key persons uh, from national park managers or external experts, uh, experts. And also we had um, questionnaire surveys. Here the numbers uh, show the, uh, the questioned people in the Tara case study with national park employees, local people and tourists. And now some words about uh, to present uh, Tara National Park. It is found in Western Serbia in the inner Dinaridas mountain range. Uh, the Tara Mountains um, are in fact medium mountains and it is a partly karstic area. Uh, the National Park was founded here in 1981 uh, in a time where it was the former inner part of uh, Yugoslavia. But in the 1990s there were wars here and uh, several newly uh, independent countries were created so now it is a 
state boundary between Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. So it has some consequences on the socio-economic uh, development and the possibilities of the area. Now here is a map about uh, the area. You can see the Drina River, which also the boundary between the, the two countries. And the Tara National Park is marked with the green colors. Uh, the most important town and the center of the national park is found in Bajnabashta, which is formerly outside the national park boundaries. And um, here is the area mostly with the uh, karst plateaus. Uh, some words about the values of this area. Uh, there are karst forms, uh, which include a lot of about thousands of sinkholes, uvalas and tri valleys. But uh, there are only few cases which are not suitable for tourism. There are also smaller features such as karen, mainly subsoil karen, and the most spectacular landforms of uh, Tara National Park are, to my opinion, uh, the gorges. There are smaller gorges where you can uh, make uh, adventure tours, and also there is the Drina River uh, Gorge, uh, which is also the international boundary. Uh, you can go there by boat trips, because uh, access to this area is very difficult by walking. Uh, second type of values are biodiversity. We already talked about this, that geodiversity and biodiversity uh, should be together to make it stronger. So the 80% of the area is covered by forest. And um, a very important species is the Serbian spruce, which is an endemic uh, type of uh, tree here. And anyway, there is a very high biodiversity. As for the animals, the largest brown bear population in Serbia is found just here. Uh, so it became also the symbolic animal of the national park. And there is also a cultural heritage uh, within or uh, around uh, the national park. Anyway, it is not unspoiled nature as in a, in a classical national parks of the United States. So there are several man-made objects here. For example, the Drina River was dammed in 1966 at Peruchach, which made the whole Drina Gorge partly uh, a lake or a, or a special lake, we can say. And also, two decades later, a new lake was created uh, at uh, Zauvina, which is a pumped storage lake to make uh, the uh, the operation of the hydroelectric power plant more economic. Now let's speak about the socio-economic problems. Uh, first, we can mention the depopulation and aging. Of course, it's a worldwide phenomenon, and the reasons are similar, generally. Lack of employment, lack of services, and lack of infrastructure, which causes people to uh, migrate away from the area and the natural decrease. And uh, we found in our earlier studies that as we got deeper in these uh, circles, the, the depopulation problem becomes more serious. So in general, there, we can speak about rural depopulation, but the mountainous areas are more seriously touched and cast in mountainous areas are many times even more seriously touched. So we had a demographic analysis uh, for the Tara area already published in a journal. And uh, we found that this area was a very homogeneous area in terms of population and villages uh, about uh, 60, 70 years ago. But it has been changed. There was a remarkable population flow from mountains to valleys since the 1950s. And also there is an absolute decrease of population in the region since 1991, which is otherwise true for all Serbia. Aging is also serious, especially in the mountainous parts. However, uh, with a sophisticated analysis, we found that uh, the topography is in a moderately strong uh, statistical relationships with uh, demographic characteristics, but the cast had no special effect on demographic characteristics. So here we can speak about simply mountain depopulation as a predominant uh, process. Now let's see what we had uh, from the, the interviews and uh, the questionnaire surveys. Uh, the deaf population <clears throat> is one of the first problems mentioned by the managers of the national park and of local tourist organizations. 
they uh, experience the lack of people. It's not so easy to find people for hard physical work, which is a problem in forestry. There is also lack of more educated people, which may be a problem for tourism sector. And also there is lack of people for traditional agriculture. However, as the National Park Director said, the protection without people is fragile. What is the opinion of local people? They don't directly mention the population, but if uh, we ask them if you would like to move away from this area, if it were possible, 36%, uh, a little bit more than one third, answered yes. About half of them to abroad, and one third of them to a larger city or to the capital, Belgrade. The second uh, circle of problems is with the infrastructure. Um, most people mention that the roads are very bad if we uh, ask them about the actual situation of the settlement. In fact, both the National Park and the hydroelectric power plant try to improve this situation, but uh, these efforts are not yet enough. There are still certain villages and some localities in the National Park that are difficult to assess. Uh, I think that the order of goals in the National Park is, is very interesting. Uh, there were several changes in the order of goals worldwide from the Yellowstone beginning uh, to our days. Here in this special National Park, the manager said that biodiversity is the first priority. Even the, the employees also uh, scored it uh, the highest points uh, to uh, biological values and the last point for science. But if we ask uh, local people, uh, they found that tourism, from their viewpoint, tourism is the most important goal of the national park, but uh, science again is uh, the less important. Uh, in the Tarn National Park, forestry has a very special situation. It's very important because 80% of the national park incomes come from the forestry. Um, forestry. Uh, also, high proportion of employees work in forestry. Of course, the forest management plans are in accordance with nature protection. If we look at the, the number of uh, scientists who are working at uh, the National Park, we found that there are 28 forest engineers. There are several biologists, but only one geographer and no geologist at all. Some problems of the forest here in the National Park are climate change, uh, which means uh, drying. And also the karst is a problem. There are occasional forest fires on plateaus that are very difficult to extinguish uh, due to the lack of water. And also there's a problem with bark beetle, which is managed by thermal baited traps. The tourism is a very complex issue. In the recent years, we experienced a relatively quick increase. Uh, this year was very special, but due to domestic uh, tourism, it was also with high numbers. So there are about 200,000 visitors a year, uh, but it is still not, not yet uh, mass tourism. It is based more on weekend houses than on larger scale facilities or hotels. Fortunately, there is a good cooperation between National Park and the tourism organization. And uh, you will see on the next slide, the very special marketing effect. In fact, everyone agrees that uh, tourism should be developed more, it should be more professional, and there are still many unused potentials, and it should be on a sustainable basis. There are some tourist-related or tourism-related problems, but the negative effects, uh, including uh, garbage or pollution, pollution are not yet serious. There is a seasonality, which means that the tourist season is uh, restricted to the two summer months and uh, for short visits. And of course, there is a wastewater problem uh, on the past areas. Uh, about uh, the marketing, uh, this house was on an artistic photo in National Geographic magazine, and it became very popular. And there was also a TV show in China. So there are a lot of Chinese tourists, which is otherwise not so typical in Serbia or in this part of uh, the country. So this was just due to one, uh, well, uh, nice image. How local people consider uh, tourism, 80% support the increase of tourism, and uh, about one third is directly involved in tourism, mainly by accommodation or selling goods or uh, a little number with uh, guidance or catering. For local people, tourism 
uh, is more important than uh, nature. Of course, nature is also important for them, but uh, they, uh, <coughs> for their life, uh, tourism is more important. Uh, uh, what is their opinion about the national park? Uh, first of all, we can say that uh, the national park is really present in the life of local people. 50% uh, of uh, local people works at the national park or know someone as friend, family member who works at the national park. Um, when we ask them if they have an influence on the national park policy, uh, most of them uh, answered no. However, there is a council of users of the national park, uh, which includes uh, the national park representatives, local municipalities, NGOs, and also the hydroelectric power plant. If we try to uh, summarize the advantages and drawbacks of the national park for local people, we found that uh, about uh, half of these people found that there are significant advantages for them uh, due to the existence of the national park, which is mostly connected uh, to tourism. And also there are about one third of them found drawbacks, which is in connection with construction and uh, complex procedures and uh, this. Uh, okay. And uh, so the final balance, how you uh, appreciate it, then we found that most people are on the positive side. So they say that the national park is very good or rather good, or at least neither bad nor good for them. And national park employees agreed that the national park significantly improves the society economic conditions of uh, local people. So concluding what has been said, we found um, that the national park can help the local society economic development by employing local people, by increasing tourism, by different forms of support, and by attracting projects to the area, which means attracting money to this uh, area. The plans of the national park are to improve infrastructure, to increase sustainable tourism, to support livestock. And there are several car specific uh, things in the national park. Uh, I would like to say one thing here, that there is a difficult access of the area due to the river gorges and um, the plateaus, which is the main reason for the forest could be preserved and the reason for being a national park here. And for the tourists, the plateau edge viewpoints and the gorges are the most spectacular areas. Here is a national viewpoint uh, from a plateau edge over with a panorama over uh, Trina River Lake. And uh, here is an abandoned shepherd's hut on the uh, Tarapato, which is a symbol of how people lived here and how, and the question is how they live now. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, I apologize for that. Um, it may- I stop sharing? My, um, my chimes are not coming through. Um, is that the case? Did you hear it? Pardon? No, I, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Did you? Okay. Did you guys uh, hear when I chimed? Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, um, we will go on. I apologize for that. We were, we were definitely over time. Um, I don't I'm know. Sorry, yeah, yeah. My okay. chimes aren't coming through. Um, our next speaker then is Zoltani Mex. He is a associate professor at the Faculty of Geography at Boabesh Boyoy University in Romania. He teaches technical geography topics, uh, GIS, remote sensing, to Hungarian speaking students. And many years ago, he was an enthusiastic caver. All right, thank you, Zoltan. Hello, thank you. It's a great honor for me being uh, participating in this plenary session. Is it okay? Can you hear my voice? Can you see my screen? Yes. And can you see my uh, laser? So uh, I think I don't need any presentation because um, Sarah presented me already. Everything is through what she said. Maybe it's strange for you that I'm from Romania and I am Hungarian and I work with Tomasz. 
but uh, the project is an international project. And um, as part of this project, I will present you in a few words the Apusen Nature Park. Uh, why is not going? Oh. So these are the parks involved in the project presented by Tomasz. As you see, Apusen Nature Park is in the western part of Romania. And actually, Apusen is the name of the mountain. It means the sunset mountains because they are in the western part of the country. And as you can see on the map, a pretty large area of the mountain is the nature park. It's uh, more than 76,000 hectares. Actually, in Romania, there are 29 parks. Uh, 16 of them, are, um, of them are nature parks and 13 are national parks. As uh, a few words about, uh, because you speak about karst, it's very important to see the geology of the territory. So as you can see on the map, uh, almost uh, a half of the territory is covered by Mesozoic sediments, which are most suitable for karstification. So it's clear that we will have karst formations here. About the relief, the mean altitude is 1,120 meters, and most of the territory is above 1,000 meters altitude. You can see the hypsometric map of the park. As regarding the hydrology, uh, maybe you can see that the territory uh, flows out in three different directions, to east, to west, and to south, in different uh, uh, rivers, but all of them are belonging to the Tisza and to Danube. But what is important that we can see some endoraic areas, which from karstic uh, point of view, they are very important and they are suitable for complex karst systems to develop. A few words about the land cover. You can see a sentinel satellite image made in October and you can see that almost a half of the territory is covered by forest. Uh, Spurs fir and uh, beech are the most important species from the forest and some grassland, as you can see on the image. From uh, administrative point of view, the park belongs to three counties. And inside the park, there are 53 settlements. All of them are villages with different sites. You can see the uh, symbols showing the population number. We can speak about five tourist village or touristic village, which doesn't have a permanent population. They um, exist <laughs> only in season. And altogether, the population is almost of 10,000 people. Um, if you remember the geological map, you can see that all these natural touristic attractions, which we extract from a touristic map and we complete it with our choice, they lay over the karstic area. So there are, besides caves, there are many other touristic attractions in the park. Uh, when we speak about tourism, it's very difficult to say how many people are visiting the park. The park administration appreciates that, that their number is somewhere around 500,000 visitors per year, but it's very difficult to give a clear number because uh, there is no entrance in the park. It's a nature park, not a national park. There are roads crossing the park. There are people living inside, so it's very difficult to say exact, the exact number of tourists. As uh, about protected areas, uh, according to European Environmental Agency database, there are 55 nature reserves and nature monuments inside the park. And 41 of them are linked to the karst. There are 25 caves gorges, surface karst forms, and karst springs. Uh, about the caves, I will speak later. Um, okay. These are the, those 55 protected areas inside the park. 
Uh, let's speak about the caves generally in Romania. In Romania, we have more than 20, uh, 12,000 caves. So that I think that's a great number of caves. All of them are protected, but there are, according to some laws, which are mentioned there, there are classified in four categories. Category A uh, is, are the caves of exceptional value with scientific importance or uniqueness of the resources. And the important thing is that no intervention is allowed excepting for protection, for instance, building gates to protect them. All of these are considered scientific reserves and any other activity, even research or spell tourism or documentation can be made only by the authorization of the Romania, Acad of the Romania Academy. 29 caves of those 12,000 12, are in this category. Category B are, uh, let's say, less important, are of national importance, distinguished by size or importance of their uniqueness of their or touristic potential. These can be declared national monuments. Most of them are already declared national monuments or national reserves. And there are 59 such caves in the country. Class C, caves of local importance, which are protected for their geologic, hydrologic, historic values or touristic potential or size. And 20 such caves are in class C. And class D are all the other caves which cannot be included in categories A, B and C. I think this is an interesting uh, categorization used in our country. As um, in totally, there are 132 caves included in A, B and C categories and some of them are included or they have parts with which are included in class A or others in class B. For instance, one part is uh, visitable by tourists, tourists and another part is strictly protected as a scientific reserve. As uh, if we speak about the nature park, in, inside the nature park, there are more than 1,500 1, caves, which is uh, more than 12% of all caves of the country. And 37 caves are classified in one of those classes presented previously. You can see the graphic showing the number of these. It's interesting that there is a pretty big number of mixed caves. So there are, they have sectors a and B or B and C. Um, in the nature park, we have four uh, so-called show caves. So caves that are, uh, can be visited by tourists. These are Bears Cave, which is in category A plus B, Skarishwara Ice Cave, also in category A plus B, Porta Luyonele, which is, uh, less important, I'd say so, on the top ice cave. About their management, we can say that there are three different management types. Actually, this means that all of them are managed by the park, but with the help of different organizations. We will see this in detail. Bears Cave is, uh, we may say, the most important show cave in Romania. It was accidentally discovered in 1975 as, as uh, is a touristic cave since 1980. It has uh, a lot of uh, Ursus Pelleus remains. That's uh, where the name came. The cave is managed as with, uh, by the park, but based on a bailment agreement with the, par with the private company. Uh, I consider interesting maybe for you that how much is a ticket? <laughs> It's something about six dollars, uh, so it's not a very expensive uh, <clears throat> price. And as you can see, there one part is going to the park. The number of visitors uh, in the ten years period it's about seven seventy thousand. That's the average. Some images from the cave. The cave is very rich in spelotines. 
Another Skiriswara R scheme, which is a, an I scheme, you can see some details here and some images. Porta Luyanella, I told you this is less important. It's a small cave, but it's also visitable by tourists. The number of visitors is uh, taken together for those two caves which, because they are uh, managed by the local community in cooperation with the park. The maximum, the average number is about 60,000. And there is another small cave which is touristic since 2010. Uh, it's very important because some uh, it was discovered in 1974 a footprint of the Neanderthal man, which is considered to be 62,000 years old. Some problems. The area is a favorite place for hiking. Accommodation capacity based on the official data are about 2,500 beds, almost in mainly in roading house and pensions, but camping infrastructure is not enough so actually wild camping is typical which uh, grows to a problem of waste disposal so this is how it looks a few days ago one of the favorite places for camping and after a heavy rain the sinkhole looks something like this unfortunately thank you very much I know 10 minutes is a very short time. There are many, many other things to say, but that's it. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Zoltan. We appreciate that. Um, we are about 10 minutes behind schedule. And so our thought was to go ahead and skip questions for this talk and move to the next speaker. Um, but we can definitely get folks uh, in touch with the speakers um, if people do have questions. And so hold on to those, let us know, and we'll do our best to get you in touch. And so our next speaker then is Yasna Fakin Bayet. Uh, she is a researcher in the Research Center of the Slovenian Academy of Science and Arts in Europe, where she focuses on heritage studies, especially on the development of participatory methods for fostering an integrative approach in the management of cultural resources. All right, thank you, Yasna. Hello to everyone, good morning. Uh, so uh, I will present the paper which was prepared uh, in the framework of the network of University of the Škodja Caves Parks uh, in Slovenia. So Slovenia is a small country in the central of Europe and Karst region is in the west part of uh, Slovenia. Uh, so um, maybe uh, the uh, authors, we are all from the humanities and social sciences and firstly I will present some theoretical background of um, why it's important to include in sustainable development culture and, uh, and culture um, heritage and then I will present you a case study uh, how, why are caves important and how uh, the attitudes of people towards the caves. Um, so some characteristic of our cars in Slovenia. So no development can be sustainable without the involvement of the culture of local people who throughout history have perceived, interpreted and adapted the natural resources to their needs and knowledge. In this way, they have created a cultural landscape this is not to be understood as a visible or tangible phenomenon or something that does not change, but something that is always in process, in which the inhabitants constantly change and recreate according to their, to their way of life, so to, to their culture. One of the first activities of man in the environment is its naming. In pre-modern times, our ancestors lived in harmony with nature since they did not have the modern technology, knowledge and artificial materials that we have today, natural resources presented important survival assets for them. For this reason, they also had a spiritual and emotional attitude towards natural resources, towards the caves or stones or uh, landscape and so on. 
uh, their knowledge, skills, and rituals could be effectively adapted to mitigate the technologically overloaded environment and to revive a cultural landscape. Although a culture is recognized as an important part of the human experience and as a driver of sustainable development, according to Agenda 2030, many challenges have to be solved by different actors to put theory in practice. So the main purpose of my presentation is to reflect on specific natural and cultural elements like caves or landscapes that have had different meanings, significance, and values through history. I will try to explain why it is necessary to explore or to research history from prehistoric times and to know the way of life of the local population to understand the meaning of cultural elements or resources correctly and to use them sustainably. But first of all, we have to answer a question, what is culture and why is culture important for development? Culture is understood here in a broader context as a whole way of life of people. Every culture consists of numerous practices of people who design as well as participate in social, political, economic, cultural, ritual processes and with them inherit, create, modify, or transform numerous tangible and intangible elements. These elements are identification symbols for constructing and straightening local identity. And our local identity is very important for, for also for sustainable development. Tangible and intangible elements from the past that are valued in the present, according to different measures, are called cultural heritage. The concept of heritage no longer refers only to the conservation, protection, and presentation of selected monuments or intangible practices, but also includes their use and adaptation to different contemporary needs and purposes. When we try to use element of culture or cultural heritage for sustainable development, we must pay attention to the meaning, importance, functions, values of elements that have been attributed to them by local people. The meanings could be found or recognized as thoughts, ideas, feelings, memories, experiences, legend, local stories, that, um, that can be found in oral or written historical resources. So through interviews, we can also find out the meanings that people put to the, to the elements. The meanings and functions of cultural elements have changed over time and depend on various natural and social circumstances. If some elements have a net negative meaning among people, it is worthwhile to find out the reason for this. In this way, it is easier to adapt cultural objects to contemporary needs and to find out a way to combine traditional and contemporary meanings. So why some stones are negative meanings and symbolize um, backwardness and why not? Now I will briefly present you a case study from the Scotian cave areas that you will better understand our reflections and purposes. So underground world and caves are one of the most recognized natural and cultural features of the Karst region that construct the identity of the Karst landscape as well. People have visited caves in the Scotian area since the Upper Paleolithic. In the Neolithic period and Copper Ages, they were visited only periodically for burials and ritual practices. The uh, caves in the Scotian, uh, uh, Scotian um, were uh, differently used as in another part of the Karst region, which were mainly used as uh, shelters or ship forts. In the cave Tominceva Yama, copper age bones of about 10 individuals have been discovered. 
found of pottery and animal bones in the same stratum indicate a common participation in rituals related to burials and special treatment of bodies. In the cave Mushyayama, hundreds of metal objects, mostly weapons and animal bones, testify that the cave was a supra-regional cult location in the late Bronze Age. Some of the caves in the park and in the wider karst region were also understood as entrances to the world beyond or after life. The ethnological and folklore research re find, uh, show that caves usually function as the dwelling places of different supranatural beings. Together with the motive of supranatural passage of time, which tells about entering into another dimension through caves that is not ours, that indicate their liminality. Often caves are associated with childbirth, frequently in connection with the ambivalent mythic Baba or Hek, who brings newborns out of the cave or helps with childbirth. On the other hand, this mythical uh, Baba also feeds dead children or eats or bakes them in the cave, which connects the caves to death. In the traditional perception, the birth of children is understood as the process of soul transition from the world of the dead, where souls of dead or children are kept, that is, in the caves. For this reason, it's not surprising that fertility rituals took place in the caves as well, as evidenced by oral traditions as, uh, as well as archaeological foundings. The caves thus functioned in the landscape as a place of transition to the world of the dead, from where fertility comes into the world of the living. With the expansion of the science in the 19th century, however, this traditional perception of caves has slowly disappeared. Nevertheless, even in the early modern era, caves were still visited by adventurers and first tourists, eager to explore the mysterious and unknown underground world. We can therefore assume that cave tourism is one of the oldest tourist activities that have developed in the Kars region of the Slovenia territory. What happens today? Today, the secret meaning of the case and the meaning of the mysterious legend have lost their significance and warning rule. But when we are researchers or managers try to find out methods and approaches to show people why it is important to protect our environment and how it can be used sustainably for the development purposes, these secret meanings could be add values in raising people awareness and show why these cultural resources are not just an no object to observe, experience, protect or safeguard, but the elements to learn why our nature is so important, why our nature is secret. For the, uh, uh, for the end, I will show you a mythical park in the village Rodik near the Scotian caves, where we try the, to show why the, these prehistoric traditions, how it could be preserved and how it could show people why it is important to use this traditional knowledge for the sustainable uh, development. Thank you very much. Great, so um, we've got a few minutes left on the timer. If you'd like to take maybe a question um, and then we can get back on to our last talk and wrap up. Still a little bit behind schedule, but it um, be nice to get a question in. Thank you, Yasna. Um, I didn't have any, um, I don't know if anyone has uh, typed in any questions um, into the chat, but I really love um, all the points you brought up about, you know, all the intangible parts um with the tangible like it's 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 you need a holistic view when you're looking at this um and how it fits in and just that whole cycle of life death you know um that to me um 
that's what connects us with the environment, you know, and, and it's very explicitly um, in those um, in those tales. So thank you for you know well, sharing that. I like if it. you want to find out some something more about how to use cultural heritage, we will uh, together with Daria from Park Škotjanski, yeah, we will present some more cases in the on our workshop in, on Wednesday. So right. welcome, yes. Thank you for sharing that. And yeah, join us for the Cultural Heritage Workshop on Thursday. Excellent. Um, so now for our final speaker for the session, we have Taha Yunus Arid is a PhD Geosciences and Geoheritage um, from Shoyeb Dukeli University in Morocco. He works on the assessment, protection and management of the geological heritage, to provide a basis for local sustainable development through geoeducation and geotourism. Thank you, Ta. Thank you, Sara. So uh, let's do a quick check. Do you see my presentation? Uh, not yet. Not yet, okay. Share screen. And now? Yes. Okay. Good to go. So thank you a lot, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues, hoping that you are doing well in those uh, harsh time. I would like to express my uh, pleasure to be here to talk about Moroccan caves and their implications in the scientific, geoeducational and geotouristic programs through speleological activities. Uh, as, uh, as you said, I am a PhD in geoscience and geoheritage and associate researcher in the Department of Geology in the uh, uh, Faculty of Science. I am also a cave -in instructor and a member of many associations working uh, in education and sport. And this presentation will begin with the geographic and geological situation of Morocco, examples of uh, some Moroccan uh, famous caves, the role of civil society in karst protection and promotion, and we'll finish with some conclusions and perspectives. So, Please let me first introduce Morocco, which is located in the northwestern part of the African continent and limited to the west by the Atlantic Ocean and to the north by the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, it's known by its hospitality and history and considered as the door of Africa and as one of the most fascinating land uh, in the world from the point of view of its geological and uh, evolution. The quality of the geological records spanning out from the Archaean to the Quaternary, the paleontological richness, the uniqueness of the outcrops, and also the countless geomorphological forms and landscapes are assets that worked Morocco to possess an impressive geodiversity, notably its rich and abundant karstic occurrences. Morocco has experienced uh, an important uh, geological evolution. During this evolution, several, uh, several sequences of carbonates Deposits occurred. Moreover, the geological, tectonic, and hydrogeomorphological history has ensured the evolution of karst future on various areas, especially in the Rift Mountain in the north, uh, the High and the Middle Atlas, and the Atlantic coast, very well known for their high, high karst density. So uh, several lithological, structural, and geochemical factors fall within the, the mode of the karstic structures formation and the contact between uh, water and rock. Indeed, the genesis uh, of this karst feature is marked by an intense hydrothermal activity along uh, fracture surfaces. All those parameters are scientifically relevant in order to determine the intrinsic characteristic of the environment. Therefore, the Moroccan caves yielded so far unexpected human and animal uh, remains, which contributed to the understanding of the origin and evolution of our species and their paleoecosystems. The most relevant example, as you can see, are the unearthed old school from, uh, from Homo sapiens, from Jebel Irod caves, and the ancient human DNA recovered from the Pigeon cave near Tafugat. At that point, let's introduce some of the most famous caves in Morocco. And uh, one of the most famous caves is Ifriwatu near uh, Taza region. It's uh, 271 meters uh, depth and is considered as the only karst that fits out for touristic activities. And as you can see 
uh, in the pictures. Uh, touristic infrastructures have been built to regulate visitor flow. With a length of 3,500 meters, it is also classified as the third deep abyss of Morocco and contains abundant, diverse and spectacular landscapes uh, with attractive calcite and gypsum formation. And here we have the Wind Team Dwin Cave, one of the largest caves in Africa, but also the largest groundwater reserve in the region. It is the longest cave in Morocco, located near the Agadir city in the High Atlas, and spread for approximately 18 kilometers. Now, at the, at the left, you see the Ain Danu cave, which is located in the Rif mountain in the north and considered as the most important water storage in the region. At the, the right, you see the Waralar cave, uh, which is the seventh deepest chasm in Morocco and was reported in 1955 uh, as a vast natural well about 30 meters deep with excellent concretion and the block of ice at the bottom of the cavity. But the truth is actually minus 210 meters and the name uh, Ifri Wagala means the bottomless abyss because you could never hear the, the stone you threw into it. But beside the scientific significance, the cars has ecological, aesthetic, uh, economic and historical magnitude that is reaching out to communities according to their own habits and traditions, as the case of El Goran Cave uh, near El Jadida in the Atlantic coast. It is exactly located at the Cap Bedouza uh, and shelters uh, an important biodiversity and archaeological remains such as uh, rock engraving and, and uh, pottery. However, the combined uh, action of natural triggers uh, and anthropogenic harms weakens the underground environment and threatens the integrity of karst in all its aspects. Uh, accordingly, uh, the use of cave, uh, of caving activities and their adjustment to the target group can be an intelligent solution to this issue. Uh, degradation, uh, vandalism, uh, are all uh, anthropogenic harms that uh, weakens this, uh, this uh, underground treasure. Of course, it can allow scientific outreach and, the, and the direct awareness building uh, on the importance of the underground geoeditage through geoeducation. In this order, and uh, as I read in the, in the chat uh, before, uh, we cannot wait for, for uh, government uh, actions. So in this order, the, uh, the civil society frequently takes the lead promoting and protecting uh, the underground. Therefore, we would like to share some activities conducted by Moroccan uh, associations uh, at the benefit of child uh, and youth. Those activities are also oriented to scholar and researcher to further promote scientific researches. So this contribution uh, aims uh, essentially to, to present and highlight uh, examples of scientific, educational and touristic initiatives uh, carried out by civil society bodies uh, in order to advocate for the protection of the cars geoheritage in Morocco. It will also discuss the different uh, future outlook for the conservation uh, of these natural resources and their implication through the process of sustainable socio-economic development of local communities. As uh, introduced at the beginning, I am personally a speleology instructor and they work in, us in partnership with many associations. But uh, two years ago, we have created with uh, some colleagues from the geology department, uh, the Association du Cala for Speleology, Geotourism and Geoeditor. Our mission spread from uh, education to technical trainings. In fact, we organize uh, round tables, workshops and technical sessions to introduce the karst system and the different speleological gears and techniques for the benefit of university students. The students that took part of those activities give very good uh, feedback of satisfaction uh, regarding the proposed activities. For more than one, it was the first time they used such gear uh, or techniques, and for almost all of them, the first time they visited the underground wonders. Uh, another uh, active association in terms of education and uh, sensibilization and the Moroccan uh, is the Moroccan Association of Climbing and Canyoning. It is one of the rarest associations in Morocco that accompany child, 
and youth into caves and cooperate with schools. The activities are also dedicated to Moroccan scholars and foreigner uh, tourists, non-specialists uh, that want to discover the underground beauty and familiar, familiarize with the uh, caving techniques and equipment. So uh, uh, I work with this structure uh, since uh, 2012 and I have uh, benefit from trainings and been part of international expeditions thanks to them uh, as I will uh, show in the, next, uh, in the next slide. Here a uh, picture of uh, the advanced level training course for speleological instructors uh, held in Todragolj in the south of Morocco in uh, 2014. It, uh, it has been conjointed, organized by Moroccan associations and French Federation of Speleology. And during this training, the, the focus was on uh, technical aspects of caving, such as cliff equipment, relay installations, splitting. Uh, it has also been focused on the underground uh, topography and cartography. Another important aspect was uh, workshops on escaping techniques. Uh, this eight-day training has been cluttered by uh, certificate delivery and the formed network is still active and cooperating. Here are some pictures of the international expedition in Talasantan National Park. Uh, this uh, 18 days expedition was organized also by several associations and French associations uh, in uh, collaboration. It has benefited from the support of the national park, the local authorities, and uh, the accommodation was assured by local uh, structures. The main goal uh, has, been, has been the follow-up of the explorations and uh, prospecting, tracking cavities, identification, local toponymy, and uh, continuation of the topographic survey. We have also surveyed uh, the Kef and Sur, which uh, picture you see now. And this association is also engaged in scientific research in partnership with, uh, with many universities and work on the projects of establishment of a national inventory using new technologies. Uh, it also promotes uh, sustainable tourism, especially geotourism, in order to promote local communities' uh, lifestyle. At this view, the association maintains a close relationship with the local uh, population which uh, most of time are responsible for food, hosting and guiding. And such activities generate economic incomes and awareness rising among uh, the locals. Whenever they are aware of their uh, richness, they start being the dedicated caretakers of the caves located in their homeland. So to conclude, uh, we have remarked that there is a very high uh, and diverse karstic potential uh, alongside a growing interest on caving activities in Morocco. Although the Moroccan civil society is very active in promoting the karst resources, even there is no specific legal framework to protect this richness. And we think that it's necessary to consider the caves as a geoheritage components. We have some perspective uh, for the next, uh, next years, and we, we want to foster the cooperation between uh, all the interested associations and attract more people and scholars and make uh, cave-in trainings accessible for all. We want also to propose more cave-in training scores for cavers and to establish national cave inventory. Then we would like to establish an inventory methodology dedicated to identify and assess the caves in Morocco. And many thanks for your interest and attention. I think we have a question from Aaron Schmid. Yes, welcome. And, um, or is that Katie? If you just, uh, um, can you unmute yourself? You should have the ability. Oh, there you go. There we go. Sorry. Yeah, I couldn't change it from my husband's name this time, but I have a question about how do you, with this tourism and all the training, how do you still protect the cave environment? Uh, we, we, we want to work uh, by levels. At the first level is to inform local communities because they are responsible. They live, they live in the field. So uh, sometimes we, we have some uh, smugglers and if you come in a, in, a, in a rural area, it's not possible to, to go uh, without being seen. The locals, 
have to see you and to control why you enter to this cave, if you are association, if you are an organism. So we start working with the locals because, because they are the guardians of their richness. Uh, at the second time, we second level, we work with, with schools, with the uh, universities, we to, to raise uh, awareness. So they start protecting, even if they visit some caves, they protect it. So we protect the cave indirectly by giving uh, information to child and to youth. I think at this level, it's all we can do as, uh, as civil, uh, civil bodies, as associations. Uh, we can also propose some, uh, some uh, legal, uh, some uh, laws to, to be modified. We can make some inventories, but as associations, we cannot do a lot. So we work at the levels we can reach. That makes good sense. Thank you. If you have uh, any other questions, I will be happy to, to answer. And uh, if not now, you can email me directly. You have my emails and they will be very happy to, to discuss. Great. Well, if you guys want to unmute yourselves and give all of our speakers a round of applause for this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.